My name is Justin Muscolino, and I want to welcome everybody today to Introduction to Financial Management. There's a lot of topics to cover. We'll get through everything in a timely manner. So in specifics, what we're going to talk about today is the concept of finance, the historical perspective, way back when, when it all started and up to the current date, financial management and business. What do businesses do? What's their objectives? What are they trying to handle? And then we'll talk about the goals of financial management. Every business needs a goal. Profit maximization and other features we'll talk about. The role of the finance manager, the coordination, talking to different groups within the company and also externally. The agency theory, we'll go into a little detail about that. So the concept of finance originated from economics. It talks about the different components and how it feeds into the grand scheme of the economy. Now, limited money, unlimited requirements for money. There's many uses for money from the traditional sense to the current sense. And you look at it, there is the real currency and virtual currency, two different distincts. But you gotta remember, there is limited money out there, but there are unlimited requirements. The time value of money. This is an important concept. Now, the time value of money really talks about a dollar today is worth more tomorrow, meaning we don't know what's going to happen with the economy. We don't know what's going to happen with interest rates, uh, currencies, and things like that. But the key concept here is a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. Now, what about refinance refers to cash, banks, investment loans, um, funds, et cetera. Now, finance relates to a lot of different topics, and we'll go, go into it a little bit further in this presentation. But when you think about finance, yeah, you probably talk about think about the economy, the stock market, but how does everything feed into the economy and the stock market? It's important to understand what businesses do to raise their profile investment-wise and how they capitalize on it. But the ultimate goal is profit maximization. How do you make money not only to cover your overhead, pay your employees, day-to-day -day expenses, but also shareholders, you know, investors overall? You know, it all feeds into and the incline of history of finance over the years. Now, there are three broad areas of finance. Personal finance, individually, like you and me. What do we do with our finance? How do we live? You know, how do we make money down the road for retirement and other things? We have business finance. Now, same thing what I mentioned before, business finance. You know, how do businesses arrange their financial aspects so they can operate? How do they make money for investors and so on? And then you have public finance. Now, public finance, a little bit different, but it's a combination of the two. Um, what is it? How is it perceived from the public perspective? How are you making money out there? And so on. Now, financial management, the application of management principles to financial activities. You know, how do you operate, right, from a management philosophy? What's the philosophies that you put in place? Because you think about it, you need to understand, you have to have a plan, a financial plan on how you're going to achieve certain directives. Now, financial management, it is an art and a science of managing money to meet predefined objectives. Think about yourself. Now, you want to save money for retirement. How are you going to do it? How are you going to manage your money to achieve those objective, objectives? Very important. Uh, it's also the process of planning, organizing, controlling, and monitoring financial resources with a view to achieve organizational goals and objectives. You have to have a plan. You, you state your goals and objectives and the path on how you're going to get there. Now, in business, financial management is a process of handling a company's finances in a way that generates value, value for the overall business. Like I mentioned earlier, you have to have a plan in business because if not, your business is not going to be around for a long period of time. And next, it is an organic function. 
there is there are departments within your company, there are individuals who operate the day-to-day -day finances, and they have their goals and objectives that are typically brought down from top. You know, the board of directors, senior level, trickle those, trickle those down and define what they're looking to achieve and by when. Um, like I mentioned, you, you have designated departments, managers who function and take those goals and objectives and put them into play. And they operate the need uh, or the desire of upper level to convey them and operate within. You know, at a strategic level, financial management is all about managing the cash inflows and outflows in a way that enhances, enhances the business value. You know, if you make money as a business, you're taking money in, but then also you have to take money out and you have to constantly manage the inflows and outflows to make sure you're operating at a net positive. Now, at a tactical level, a little different, financial management is all about how financial transactions are recorded, analyzed, and reported to the higher level managements for business decisions. So the individuals who are on the front lines, who are in operations roles, they take care of the day-to-day -day management, but all the reporting, the outcomes gets fed up to management so they can make decisions short-term and long-term. of financial management, there are three. One, profit maximization, wealth maximization, and improving market share. On profit maximization, this is one of the traditional yet most important because you need to maximize profit. And as I mentioned earlier, the goals and, object and objectives of your organization, either from a business sense or the organization or on a personal sense excess of revenues over costs. Now, profit maximization. If you exceed your overhead and everything else that operates, you have profit. And that's what you have to maximize for the business day to day. Maximize units sold. What's your strategy? What's your marketing strategy to sell your products to the public? Are you selling it within a certain sector or the economy in a whole? Increasing price. You know, there are predefined formulas, how you set your price, you know, and then you have to look at supply and demand. Now, if there's excess supply, your pro process, your, pro uh, your products will probably, your price will probably drop and it goes the opposite as well. Cost minimization. Listen, you don't want to spend money that you don't have to. So when you do your annual plan and you look at all the costs that are kind of predictable, there are unpredictable costs too. You wanna, you wanna build your product, so to speak, for the least amount you can, but not sacrificing quality. And then you wanna locate opportunities to invest, inquire, acquire, and expand your business. If there's an opportunity out there, you have to look into it. Now there's an example on the screen. If you sell five electronic devices for 50,000 each, and the cost of purchase is 20,000, you will have revenues of five devices at 50,000 each, which equals $250,000 and costs of five devices at 20,000 each, that totals 100,000. Your profit will be the revenue and whatever cost is remaining. Arguments in favor of profit maximization. You know, your ba basic purpose of your business. What is the basic purpose? Because if you deviate from that, you're going to have a different model, which could sacrifice the profits that you expect to achieve. Profit is a meter for success. The more you make, the more successful you are. Profit is essential for survival. Only profit-making an entity can think of tomorrow and beyond. If you're not making profits in your business, you're not going to be around for a long period of time. Even if you have business capital to invest in your business for a year, two years, or three years, that could be depleted by not maximizing your profit and other aspects as well. Now, this is totally accepted by society because in a business, your goal is to make money. 
That's the whole point of it. So achieving those directives, obviously you have to be socially conscious and take other matters into the equation, but it is profit and it's not a sin. Profit is not a sin at all. I mean, again, it's your goal as an organization to maximize profit any way possible. Now, loss making business is a burden for society. It is. Um, because think of it, if you need governmental help, you know, or more investor help, you know, that's going to sacrifice money that could be used for other initiatives. So it's very important. The concept of profit is not clear. Gross profit, net profit. Well, gross profit and net profit, right? Gross profit is the total. Now, if you have a gross profit, yeah, you have to pay taxes and other things, which leads to your net profit. Uh, duration, long run, short run. I spoke about this again a little earlier on. You know, what, what are your goals and objectives? Because short, run, short term could be different than long run. Because if you're a new business, your short run profit, it might be small. It might just be able to get by till your strategy and business idea catches on with the public. Scale factor, synchronization between size of business and volume of prop, profit. Now, the size of your business, you have to look at it. it. What's your total overhead as far as your employees running day to day and things like that? So you have to think about all those costs together. What's the volume of profit do I need to survive? Um, it's a very important aspect to consider. You know, we talked about profit maximization as far as, far as controlling your costs. You know, you do have to co control your costs and you need to look at it. Obviously, costs can increase and de decrease based on supply and demand. And those are things that, you know, management has to be aware of and take into account. Time factor, important, just discussed, you know, you have to plan short term and long term. Um, you have to know that, again, we talked about time value of money. Money today is worth more tomorrow. But businesses have to look at today and tomorrow because they have a lot of responsibilities, um, again, for staff and other needs. Undue aggression towards profit, maximi profit maximization may lead to social evils, corruption, quality drop, misspellings, false promises, undue influence. Now, as a business, you have a lot of stress. There is. I mean, you want to achieve stardom. You want to be able to maximize profit any way you can. Well, let's just say your business is faltering, right? That you need to take a different angle to generating profit. And now we're looking more on the unethical portion. How are you going to do that, right? There's corruption. There's a lot of corruption that's rampant. You can look at the construction industry. You can look at others. Like, how do you bid those jobs, win them legitimately? Well, there's some bad actors out there that don't do it that way. And because of the stress of your business, it can lead to really poor outcomes. So you don't want to go down the negative path. You want to look at the positive path and see how you can achieve it and look for other ways to, to facilitate that profit maximization. And you need to ignore the risks associated with profit. There's always risks out there and they change every day. Look at the economy, look at businesses that operate not just domestically, but internationally as well. They have to deal with risks on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're not just talking losing your customer base and you know, supply um, profit goes down. We're talking about global aspect. You know, cybersecurity could be an impact. We're looking at legal compliance risks. We're looking at reputational risks. All of those have to be taken into account. Wealth maximization, most important objective of financial management. You have to look at the wealth component. You want to build that wealth over time. So you have to think of it about the objectives that are most important. And there are. It depends on you, yourself and also maybe the business you operate, so on and so forth. So you have to achieve a plan that makes sense for you. Increasing the value of a business in order to increase the value of shares held by the stockholders. Stockholders are there to make money. They either get paid in dividends, appreciation. There's a lot of different means. 
Now, as a business, you're trying to meet the demands of the shareholders. And yes, that could be stressful, obviously, but how do you, how you look at your business and creating wealth for shareholders is key because they're putting money and faith into you or your organization for helping them out. And you want to maximize it as much as possible without cutting corners or going into illegal aspects. Like we talked about corruption, um, doing anything that's unethical, you know, that hurts your reputation and it's going to scare away investors. Now, what is wealth? You could talk about in financial independence, um, creating avenues um, based on the wealth generated to lead to other opportunities. There's a lot of definitions for it, but achieving wealth is, you know, it's one of the primary purposes of operating a business. Um, improving the market share, market price of your share. Now we talked about stockholders, right? Now stockholders are there to invest in your company. And your goal is to have that price appreciation as much as possible. Again, without cutting corners, doing anything unethical, but you want to do what's best for the public. And I mean, it is from a shareholder sense. Now, wealth maximization examples, we talked about increased share price. Yes, again, we want to look at that from a management perspective and see where, where is our share price today? where we need to take it, and what are the expectations of the investors or just the general public. Dividend, yes, dividend, a great benefit for a lot of individuals. You know, the yields could yield from zero to five, six, seven, eight percent. People sometimes rely on that, especially if you have a, a stock. Say, for example, your company is a necessity. It might not grow to extremes. There are certain class of people who benefit from the dividend and also a little bit from the appreciation. And it's either the thing is the balance between the two. Maybe your share price is not increasing, but you have a high dividend that's going to benefit the shareholders. So that's important to look at. Arguments in favor of profit maximization goals. One, take care of the larger interests of the, of the stakeholders. You have to take care of them. Listen, we have annual shareholder meetings. We have touch base. We have market updates with analysts. We have all these things to really communicate the vision and goals. Then you have to look at the cash flows. You know, cash flows are important. What's coming in? What's coming out? You know, profits are important, but you're not going to have profits unless you, mo you monitor your cash flows and determine, you know, where is too much money going in, too much money coming out. There's a balance between two. Long-term perspectives, rather, rather unlike profit maximization goal, focusing on short-term. Um, from a business perspective, the you know, long-term perspectives are important, but you also have to focus on the short-term. If you don't focus on the short-term, you're not going to have a long-term vision. But you think about it, it's like stairs. As you step, each step you go on, you achieve another goal. And when you plan them out at the beginning, it's important to understand, like, again, how you're going to get there, what you're going to do. Um, next, we talked about time value of money. Now, time value money, again, a dollar today is worth more tomorrow. But you have to think of it from a business perspective. You know, I make money today, am I going to deploy that act, that profit back into the business? Am I going to pay shareholders? There's a lot to be done, but that all goes back to your goals and objectives. Help board members to create consistent dividend policies. Again, there's a certain segment of people out there that live on dividends. Um, depends, you know, depending on their investment goals. You know, you could look at the elder class. You know, they want safe returns from a company that's not going anywhere. So you want to have policies in effect that can be communicated but executed internally. Now there's criticisms. There's criticisms for everything. It is prescri a prescriptive idea, not a descriptive one. You know, there's always a criticisms to profit. And we talked about this also, that you can't be ashamed of making profit, but how do you go about it? How do you execute? Those are the important aspects to look at. It's not socially desirable. Listen, socially, we have to take into account on what a business does, how they operate. 
Are they doing something that, you know, is it, it's legitimate, but it's disrupting the social aspect out there. Those are things you need to consider. Um, maximizing stakeholders value is a vague term. It is a, a vague term, but now again, you look at the steps to maximize it, right? It has to be defined, and then again, executed. You know, what does it look like? Again, from short-term and long-term. The decisions of managers to maximize wealth may lead to employees' exploitation. Yeah, it might, but the board of directors needs to look at that and make those conscious decisions and have the lim most limited impact by also achieving the stated goals. So again, you could just tell by what we discussed already, there's a lot to balance in owning a business. It's not that you just build a product, you sell it and you're done. There's a lot to take into account. You have a lot of people counting on you. Improving market share, that's the goal. As a business, you wanna expand, you wanna make, you wanna get bigger and better. Now, what are this uh, percentage of total sales in the industry? Now, how are you part of that? For example, do you have 20% of the market share? Hey, maybe you make widgets or you make, you, you sell gas, right? What's your market share? How are you gonna gain market share from your competitors? Very important aspect to grow. Uh, used to give a general idea of the size of the company in relation to its market and its competitors. Now, your size of the company, theoretically, you should grow up over time. You should get a bigger market share. And a lot of people measure success at, 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 in that aspect. But they also me measure success depending on your type of business. Like, for example, I talked about necessities, right? Now you might be, your business might be slow, stable. It's gonna be, but it's gonna operate well and it's gonna provide shareholders what they wish. So, you know, you have to look at the market share and see how you could take in more, but are you in a business where your market share is gonna be slow and steady and increase over time? The market leader in industries is a company with the largest market share, it is. That's how you, it's just like profit maximization. You're valued on what you do. And in this case, you're valued compared to your competitors. Are you one in industry? Two, do you have over a 50.1% market share where you're taking over the industry and you're leading it? That's a big part. The calculation for market share is usually done for specific countries or reason, uh, regions. It is because one you have to think about is your business domestic or global? If it's global, then you have to look at the countries that you operate around the world. And you know you might be a small business just starting out or you could be a large business that's been, been going on for a period of time. But you have to look for those opportunities to increase market share, not just domestically, but globally. Investor can understand the market share of the company through various sources. Yes, you can search online. You can look at different aspects, company reportings, see where your company is at or a company and how it compares to the competitors. Increases, decreases in market share indicates the current position. Your market share is going to change. There could be new entries, new, new businesses that enter your particular sector. So you have to be on the lookout for that. Economies of scale. You know, the goal is to, if you're, for example, if you're creating more and more products, the price for that, for that product per, um, that's created, the cost should lower because you're creating more of those products. So essentially, if you, for example, you buy nails, right, for your product, the more you buy in bulk, the less the cost should be per unit. So that helps a business operate and grow. Growth in market share grows revenues too. True, you know, the bigger the market share, you're, you're the industry leading company out there and you're making money. So that should increase as well. Growing market share reduces competitors and competition. Yeah, because it's, it's a harder sector to enter. If you have a dominant market player 
uh, for example, one that has 40, 50% of the total market share, how are you gonna achieve producing a new product that's maybe state of the art, but the cost is less than the market leaders? That's an important aspect. And that's why it's hard for certain companies to break in certain industries. Companies can increase market share many different ways and listed a bunch here, reducing costs. Yes, if you reduce costs, your profits are gonna go up. Increasing volume of sales. If your salespeople keep on uh, increasing sales, yeah, your market share is definitely gonna increase. Promotion, you have to look at the marketing aspect. Are you on TV? Are you all over the internet? Are you on social media? You wanna get word of mouth out there uh, to the public so they purchase your, your products. Improving efficiency. You know, that's the goal. Finance departments within the organization look at that information all the time. They generate reporting. How can they improve efficiency? For example, like I use that nail, nail um, analogy. Now, what if you do, you build homes and you buy nails for that home? Is there a way to get it cheaper, but also effective? Those are things you need to look at. Nutri introducing new products. You know, during the course, your product might max out. So you have to look for opportunities to create new products or make your product bigger and better for the general public. Customization, standardization, you know, it depends on what industry you're on. Like say, for example, you make cars, right? You can customize those cars or you could have a standard car. It really depends. Customer loyalty, this is a big one. Because if you have customer loyalty, people are gonna buy more and more of your products in the future. And then that allows you to build off that customer base, increasing your market share, profit, sales, everything like that. New technologies. Technology, what, what's hot today might not be tomorrow. And a lot of companies have research and development departments where they look for ways to achieve efficiency without maximizing profit. So technologies for your particular product need to be looked at all the time. Talent retention. You know, if you have a great set of talent, you don't want to lose them. How do you retain them? You know, one, it could be having a great culture within your organization. Two, you can give solid raises every year, but you want to retain that talent. You want them to grow within your industry. Now, another way to get market share, if you're a more, a more mature organization, acquisitions. You know, if you're number one or number two in your market and there's a new entry, but they have a great product, you can acquire them. That's the possibility. And you can grow yourself even more. But you have to look for opportunities to increase your market share to grow bigger and better. Criticism to market share improvement. Acquisition may lead to monopoly and other factors. Now, if you, the monopoly in certain areas of the world is different. It's frowned upon, right? You don't want one dominant company that dictates prices for everybody. But that is a possibility that you can do that. Less competitors may lead to less alternatives for consumers. Yes, um, because think about it. You have five competitors and there are five different products. That's all consumers have to choose from. Now, if that goes down, obviously consumers have less to choose from. And it could be a problem in the criticism. Higher prices. You know, if we look at inflation and other ec economy-related um, aspects and terms, prices could rise. And that's going to have an impact on, one, it could have an impact on your prices, it could turn away customers because they don't want to pro uh, purchase it any longer. If it's a necessity, it might not be as bad, but if it's something like a luxury and say the economy is not going well, that could put a really big hurt on your bottom line. Unethical practices, we talked about this earlier. That's an avenue you don't want to go in because if you start doing unethical practices, it's going to lead to risk. Like if you, if your reputation is pristine, now, if you have an unethical practice, think about the reputation could get hit as an organization and that could lead to a lot of, a lot of different problems. And then your market share could decrease.
stakeholders to the business. Externally, you have creditors, governments, suppliers, tax authorities, customers, media, society. There's a lot of different stakeholders you have externally that you have to appease. Or governments, you need to pay taxes for. Suppliers, you have to pay to purchase to build your product. Now, these are aspects that you have to look at from an external nature. Internally, you have the shareholders, managers, board of directors, employees. So there's a lot riding on what you do from an internal versus ex external aspect. And you, know, you have to meet and accommodate each area of, of opportunity here. Scope of financial management. You have financing, investing, dividend, you know, financing. If you're a business, you might need to take a loan out. It's very possible. And you want to get the best terms in that loan that, that are possible. And you want to deal with a bank that's going to help you and understands your business for you to grow. So financing is big from a growth of company perspectives, but then you have to look at it from the other side. Say you sell automobiles, are you going to allow your customers to finance? You know, that also goes to your bottom line and your overall financial situation, short term, long term. And then you have to look at the financial projections of your company. Investing. How are you going to invest and what are you going to do with that money, essentially? Now, remember, you have to operate your day to day. Do you have a surplus that you can put into a fund that you can invest in for the longer term or use that money for different reasons? When you make profits, part of that could go to pay dividends, right? If you have people who are investing in your stock or shareholders, you have to pay them out. That's like excess profits. Do you always have to pay it out? No, but if you have a tradition of paying dividends for 10, 20 years and you stop paying it, that could take a big hit on your stock price. That's something you need to look at. Um, the goal of companies is to increase the dividend payment as you go forward. It's like increasing your market share, right? You know, people want to get into your stock because you're paying a good dividend, you're a thriving business, you have a good reputation, you don't do any unethical practices. So those are important to look out for. Role of financial manager, estimation of capital requirement. Where is your capital right now? Where is it going to be? Those projections are important. Procurement of funds. What are you going to do with those funds that come in? There's a lot of decisions to make from a finance perspective. And that's why you have a manager running the day-to-day -day and understanding what you could do with the funds to operate. Also, you know, again, pay dividends to shareholders. Capital structure decision. We look at efficiency. You know, though the financial manager needs to look at the different positions of the organization and see how it's managed from a structural perspective resource allocation. Now, you look at it, if you're making a lot of products, a lot of demand, you might need more employees. How are you going to allocate the resources to pay new staff or, again, retain talent and pay existing staff? You don't want to lose your existing staff because then it just costs more money to bring new employees in. Disposable of surplus. Listen, as a business, our goal is to have surplus funds. You know, that's a great outcome. It leads to so many positive aspects. Management of cash. Now, as a financial manager, you need to monitor the, the ongoing cash. Say, for example, you're making a lot of profit and you have a, a designated fund that's a very conservative fund for money, your day-to-day -day use, and you could dip into a, a moment's notice. So you look at it from two aspects. You have short-term needs, and long-term needs. Your short-term needs, you should put it into uh, an investment that makes sense and probably won't be too aggressive at all because you don't want that risk of losing money. Then you have the long-term. You don't need the money right now. You might need it in two, five, 10 years. You have to think about what's your investment time horizon.
agency relationship. Now you have the principal agency relationship. Now a fiduciary and consensual relationship is between two persons. Now the duties and responsibilities, they do differ, right? You know, principal, you have one aspect and then agency, you have another. And you don't wanna create a conflict of interest. So for example, you don't want somebody who's gonna act as a principal and agent. That's a conflict of interest. And that can create issues um, with your shareholders because somebody operating both sides um, is not a good look. That means that there could be something unethical that, that's going on that you need to look at. Now, the agency, so or an agent, it's more about self-interest. They perform the work and they transfer it to the principal. The principal in turn, you know, rewards the agent for all their work that is done. So the relationship between principal and agent is a very important one. Now, agency relationship in business. An agent, agency, a party acts on behalf and with the authority of another party. This could be an individual, like say from a sales perspective, you hire an agency or a person that ends in that handles in that capacity to sell your product, and they could get a commission. Now, the principal appoints or authorizes the agent, so the principal could go out there and look for an agent that makes sense for the business, and they can give them that commission we talked about in order to survive and make money. Because having individuals out there that are advocates for the business are important. Now, financial instruments. Financial instrument is an asset that can be traded in the market. Look at stocks, bonds. Now, we talked about stocks um, in detail, but stocks, you're a shareholder in an organization, for example. And say you want to buy it. You're going to go to the stock market. You're going to purchase it because you have your reasons for doing so. It fits with it within your financial objectives. And what if you want to sell it? You could sell it as well. So if you sell it on the market, you go out. Maybe you hire a stockbroker or somebody to transmit that. Bonds are a little bit different because you get interest payments. You can go in the market and sell it, of course, but it's a loan to the organization. And those loans do mature at a period of time. They could be short-term in nature or long-term uh, in nature. And the legal aspect's important, you know? Because um, again, it goes to the reputational hit of an organization that you invest into. And it could be real or virtual. Now, I'm sure you heard of virtual assets these days, cryptocurrencies and other new investment themes or trends. Now, depending on the individual, you might want the old traditional stock market, something, a look and feel that's different. Or if you're up on the technology of the virtual world, you see an opportunity to invest, you could look at that as well. Cryptocurrencies are new and growing, and it could be the future of our economy at some uh, date and time. Now, what are the financial instruments? There are plenty. You have equity shares, you have the ventures, bonds, which you talked about, preference shares, CD, certificate of deposits, mutual funds, T-bills, receivables. Now, each and every instrument here serves a different purpose. For example, T-bills issued by the government, they're, they're almost as a guaranteed. You get maybe a small little interest, but you know it's not going anywhere. You have mutual funds, which is a basket of stocks. So you don't want to invest in one particular stock. You can invest in a, in, a, in a basket of them, meaning let's just take technology, right? There are so many technologies out there, but you can't afford to invest in all of them. So you buy a mutual fund. You, you pay a small fee, maybe upwards of 1%, not much, but you get access to hundreds and hundreds of companies. And that's a style that people sometimes want to go into. And maybe it's less aggressive than buying individuals. It, it is. But that could be an aspect that you look into. Asset classes, money market instruments. Money market instruments are usually safe. They don't generate a tremendous re investment return. But again, it's, it's based on suitability. Uh, and again, if you're elderly in nature, you want to conserve your capital. 
and you don't want to risk the stock market. Maybe money market instruments are there for you. We talked about T-bills, certificates of deposit that are issued by banks. Um, you know, T-bills probably the safest. And then you look at CDs, you know, a bank, maybe it's a bank that's been around for a long period of time, pays a little bit more than a T-bill, but it's only guaranteed by that particular bank or institution. As far as the T-bill, it's guaranteed by the government. So you can see the difference. And the more, I would say, secure it is, usually the lower interest you receive back. And you also have commercial papers, acceptance repurchase, um, agreements. So there's different classes, but you have to look at the backing. You know, the more secure the backing, the lower, lower payments you usually receive. And then you have capital market instruments, debt, equity, derivatives, debt, loans. Again, it's loaning money to an organization. They use that money to fund expansion or any other means they need. Um, and you get a, hopefully a really good rate of return or an interest rate. Equity, again, equity, you're a shareholder in an organization and you get paid on the cap, this stock appreciation, but you could also receive dividends as well. Now, typically, um, a company that pays more dividends and, that, and the share price is so-so, is more of an, an income stream, right? An income equity. Derivatives, very aggressive. You're betting on the outcome on a particular company sector in the future. Now, sometimes when you purchase a div, div, uh, derivative, um, you know, your return is not guaranteed, meaning you could risk and lose it all. So again, it really depends on the type of individual you are and what you're looking for. Financial markets, a market in which people trade financial securities. You always have buyers, you always have sellers. Well, not always, but you do. Now, where are you going to go to do this? You're going to go to a market. You're going to go to the stock market to trade. Now, the instruments traded, again, they may be shares, debentures, T-bills, commodities, derivatives, you know, mutual funds. If you want to sell a mutual fund, you typically go to the, the company that created the mutual fund. But for other type of investments like T-bills, commodities, derivative, you go to the open market. And it is, it's a platform and enables interaction between buyers and sellers of the financial instruments. Either you might be able to go directly or you have somebody who goes on your behalf. And typically, if you go to, go to somebody who does on your behalf, you pay them a commission for the work that they do. The classification of financial markets, you know, there are a lot of them. There's the debt market. It's one of the biggest ones. I believe the money market is the biggest. You have the equity market, the primary market. Now, the primary market is where new companies come aboard. And they're only new for a period of time. So once they go through the primary market, um, they're visible to the public. After a period of time, you know, they go to the secondary market and, and conduct their trading. So they're a little bit more established. And that primary market feel only lasts maybe 90 days, a couple of months. It's a very short period of time. And not everybody can invest in that company at that period of time. And they can until it goes on the secondary market. You have the OTC, over-the-counter market, which typically it's a little bit more aggressive than the primary stock market, and a lot more shares are listed there. Uh, you have the cash market. It's what it indicates. Commodities market. You know, you're looking at the commodities, something that things that you use every day, oil, gas, things like that. Intermediaries. We talked, touched about this a little, little while ago. It's in mar a market which people trade financial securities. The instruments, again, the ventures, T-bills, commodities, derivatives, and it provides a platform for interaction between the buyer and seller. for investments in business. Now, if you're investing in the business, you have creditors, you have bondholders, 
equity shareholders, preference shareholders. And it depends. Like if you have these four blocks, bondholders again, you know, if you, you're a bondholder, you're giving money to an organization as a loan. In equity, it's not a loan. It's an investment where you get capital appreciation and potentially more dividends. If you're a creditor, maybe you're a bank that loans money to the company and you do get an interest rate as well as return for your the, for the purpose of lending money. So, and then you have preference shareholders. You have different layers of shareholders. They could be, um, you know, common stock, preferred stock. Preferred stock deals a little bit more with income. You know, you do get a little price appreciation, but you're really there for the income. Securities for business, uh, for investments in business. You know, if you look at an airplane, right, front to back, you look at, you know, front being first class, those are loans. They have primary position to get paid first, for example, if a company dissolves. And then you have bondholders, business class. Um, bondholders get paid second. And then preference or preferred um, stock, third, and then your equity. So if you're a shareholder and you purchase equity, you have the lowest priority. So you're essentially sitting in the back in couch plus. Equity, but there are advantages, disadvantages. The advantages, there's no interest burden, right? That's a good thing. It's less risky than a loan. You don't have to channel profits into a, a loan uh, repayment. You don't have to pay it all at once. Now, there are disadvantages, of course. You have to share the profit with others. You don't have the control that you, maybe you want, but you do have to sacrifice some control for you know, increasing the business that you operate. And there's always potential conflicts that you need to look out for. Now, when is it suitable? Your credit worthiness is an issue. Maybe you have a low credit rating where you have to go to other means for investment capital. You're ready to share the profit and control of the company. Maybe you're well established and you can allow somebody to purchase a certain portion of your company. You know, you're ready to share decision-making control with equity partners. Um, you know, if you're a long established, for example, if you own a business, you work really hard for five years, maybe you want to take a back seat, bring other people on to run it after you establish it. So that means you open yourself up to others come in and maybe disrupt your vision or other aspects. If you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, I want to request you to hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so that you don't miss out on any new update or video releases from Great Learning. If you enjoy this video, show us some love and like this video. Knowledge increases by sharing. So make sure you share this video with your friends and colleagues. Make sure to comment on the video for any query or suggestions and I will respond to your comments.